doing? No, no, really, how are you guys doing? Ah, that's it's more like, uh, it's Thursday, we're tired. We good? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, so by the grace of God, we want to continue uh, this awesome um, series that we've been on. About God 101, seeing God or encountering God. Um, and then today's focus is liturgy. Um, and I think this may not be completely like true, but you hear the word liturgy. There are many reactions you can have, but they range from glossing over like, oh man, not liturgy, right? To, oh my God, liturgy, right? Uh, and anywhere in between, right? That spectrum. And so, I mean, I have slides prepared. But I don't necessarily want to talk to slides so much. Um, the goal of this is seeing God and encountering God, right? And how do we see God and how do we encounter God in liturgy? But I think in order for us to even begin to expound upon that, we have to come to an agreement on what liturgy is. What do we think liturgy actually is? What do we believe it to be? How do we approach it? Why does it matter? Why is it here? Like, do we even have to do it? Like, what's the whole... What's the big deal about liturgy? So I'm going to ask you guys. I want to hear from you. What does liturgy mean to you? And there's no, there are no, there are genuinely no wrong answers because it's about what it means to you, right? Um, I love in the hymn we were just chanting, and uh, I just it was some. It struck me, and I think this is very true of any time we talk about God, anything that relates to God. Right, the verse, the stanza number six. Deep wisdom and hidden mystery, the human mind cannot comprehend. Only the eternal living God. As the the truth of liturgy. The truth of liturgy, the truth, the truth of life with God, and encountering God in anything, is that it cannot be fully comprehended here. That's the last place where it will make any sense to us. Liturgy is about experience. At least, that's what I hope to, to expound upon, hopefully. So, let's open it up. What does liturgy mean to you? What are, what are some of your, or, or even thoughts, when you hear liturgy, what do you think it means? It can either be definition or it can be your personal, yeah, George. Can we pass the, the mic around just so that we can hear? Communal worship. Okay, so something that we do... One more time. With, communal worship. There it is. Beautiful. All right. So communal worship, something that we do with others, right? And worship being, so there's two really, obviously both of those words are significant, right? Communal, meaning something that you don't do alone, right? And worship, meaning that there is a deity involved, there is a God involved, right? And there is an act of, of worship, an act of surrender, an act of glorification, right? That's happening in that if we were to unpack those words, right? So, okay, thank you. Sure. Kind of going off of that work of the people. Work of the people. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we know that liturgia, the Greek word, literally is defined work of the people. Very good. Okay. Um, and I'm, we're going we're gonna to break that one down a little more because I think we want to we wanna get to a place where we really understand what that, what that means. I want to break down work of the people. Yes? Unity with God. Unity with God. Amazing. Okay. All right. How? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. No, beautiful. <laughs> Go ahead. Wonderful. Unity with God. What else? The ultimate sacrifice. Very nice. Okay. These are all amazing. Yeah. Okay. Mm. In, in Greek, it used the word liturgion. Yeah. Like the lit liturgy to yeah. people. So it's, it's a ministry. A ministry. Yeah. A work. Very good. Okay. Yes. Forgiveness. Man, that's great. Awesome. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Heavenly, right? Something that kind of takes us beyond where we're at. I love that. Anyone else? All right. Glory be to God forever. Man, you guys nailed it. <laughs> you got all the answers. All right. We're good. Um, okay. So, yeah, we're going to repeat some of that. We're going to touch some of, those, some of those things that you talked about. 
I am going to try to broaden our understanding of liturgy a little bit, okay? Many times when we think of liturgy, when we use the term liturgy, we are thinking of what? Church, but what's more specifically? Communion, right? Eucharist. Well, oftentimes the body and blood. I want to try to change that for us. Not, that is a liturgy. That is the, liturgy, the divine liturgy. But liturgy is any time the people of God offer a work. So, we have a baptismal liturgy. We have the marital liturgy, right? The, mar- the liturgy of marriage. We have the liturgy of unction. We have the liturgy of our gathering here today. Right? Liturgy if gonna, is not something we just do in a, in a building, in a place. Liturgy is something we do together. With whom? Who's the central focus of liturgy? Whose work is liturgy? God's work. It's, yes, we say it's the work of the people. But if the people do a work, it's not our work that we're doing. What was, just to kind of try to expound this point some. Just let me just go to this. Okay, before we get into that, okay. Liturgy has two main jobs for us, if you will, two focuses, right? Preparation and fulfillment. Any idea what I'm, what I'm talking about? When I say liturgy, it's preparation and fulfillment. What do you think? What do those two terms mean to you? So there is an actual preparation that happens, right? But I would, I would argue that those are liturgies in their own way, right? Because we are putting forth a work towards God. So that's liturgy, right? So that's liturgy. But liturgy has two jobs that it does in every one of us. It prepares us and it fulfills a reality in us. Its first job is to prepare us for what? Somebody talked about it, uh, eternity. For what forever will look like, life with God. Liturgy prepares us for that. But it is also, at the same time, fulfillment of that. Liturgy is eternity today. Why? Why is liturgy eternity today? Why? How does that make any sense? Because God is present. If the eternal one is present and you enter into his presence, then you have entered into... So liturgy both prepares us for this eternity, but also mystically, again, I'm going to keep bringing up this beautiful verse from the hymn we just sat. Deep wisdom and hidden, don't ask me how. Right? Yes, it, 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 it's happening because God is present. And so what, I, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get us to understand, what I'm trying to broaden, liturgy, is no longer just something that we do in a church. Liturgy is any time we cooperate with God in his work. Communally. So thus, I even want to push that boundary a little more and say liturgy is life. Your life is liturgy. Every one of us. We are living liturgy. As Abuna was talking about within the prayer one, that something that there isn't a time, like even in your vocation, right, that can be prayerful, right? When, he was, when we were talking about even in what I do, even in what I work, that is liturgy. Okay, so I've probably already been like lost half of the room or probably like, okay, this guy's talking out of whatever, right? But what was the first liturgy? If, if, if follow the logic that I've just kind of presented to, you, to us today, What do you think the first liturgy was? Last Supper is a good choice, but it's not. 
I'm, gonna, I'm challenging. Not because, no, no, no. It was the divine liturgy. It is the basis for our divine liturgy, right? It is the, it is the theological basis for what we, what we do. But I would argue that that's not the first liturgy. Because by definition, liturgy is working. The liturgy, the, the, if liturgy is work of the people, and man was created to work with God, I'm giving the answer away, when was the first liturgy? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Creation was the first liturgy. Let's look at it. Okay. We were created to what? How were we created? Everybody knows the, the, the words very well, so let's all say them. We were created in God's image and likeness. Okay? Why? For what reason? Kid, that just have it feeling on his brother. Yes, in part, yes. In part, because he loves us. But actually, God created Adam and Eve for a purpose. Mankind was created for a purpose. In order to be in the image and likeness of God, God actually gave man a lot of his responsibilities and a lot of his attributes. Case in point, look at these bullets. We were created... In incorruption, without corruption, right? We were created to be incorruptible. We were created with the possibility to be immortal. That's an attribute of God. Incorruptibility was an attribute of God. We were created for union with God. Who said union with God? That's right, it's liturgy. We were created for union with God. We were created with free will. How do we know we had free will? Because of sin, right? We had the option to choose God or to not choose God. We had the option of free will and the tree. This makes us like God. Think about the honor that God bestowed in man, that he gave him the option to love him or not to love him, to follow him or not to follow him. And actually, as we follow the book of Genesis, we will see that there were three very clear roles that were given to Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. They were created to be rulers over creation, right? It said that Adam and Eve had authority over the, the animals and, the, and even the fish of the seas. So we were created to be kings, but kings not from an authoritative perspective, but from a caretaking perspective. We were created to be prophets, Speaking the words of God, speaking truth, living like God. That's what prophecy is. It's not telling the future, right? Prophecy is living like God, speaking the words of God, speaking truth. And we were caretakers. We were servants of the land. We were priests. Three roles. King, priest, prophet. What was the Old Testament all about? Trying to find kings, priests, and prophets. And all of them were incomplete. Right? We know what happened in the garden. But I want us to think about this for a second. And follow me on this train of thought. And push me if you think I'm crazy. It's okay. I've been called crazy. I've been called worse. My two-year-old calls me crazy, by the way, all the time. It's kind of cute. Dad, you're crazy. I, was like, I know, kid. All right, anyway. God created man. Did he know man would sin or did, did he not? was he surprised by it? He knew. Created him anyway. Meaning what? Meaning he knew that he had, to, he had to incarnate, right? Christ had to incarnate, right? Meaning he knew he had to leave for us the church, right? His body, his, his, his bread and his blood to drink, like to, to eat, to have communion with him, and to die, and to resurrect. And if we push that even further, meaning what? He knew full well that our salvation would be through 
liturgy. Eucharist is plan A for our salvation. It was always the plan. It was always the way that man was going to get Christ's image, God's image and likeness. It's not a fallback. Sometimes we think of like everything that happened after the fall as being some sort of reaction of God. Eucharist is the design. Liturgy is the plan as it's always intended to be, as it's always been intended to be. What do you guys think of that? Does that, is that? Is that resonating? Is that making any sense at all? I lost y'all. I'm done. Do you guys, like, what, what I'm trying to convey, liturgy is not something that the church drew up for us to connect with God. Liturgy was, God, was always God's plan for us. It's a very different way to look at it. I wake up very differently in the morning thinking it's just something my parents drag me to or something that Abuna sings a lot of long hymns on and that deacon who doesn't shut up with the beard, right? That guy, like, right? Versus this was always God's plan. I'm coming to liturgy because God wants me to experience him there. It's a very different approach, I believe. But also, as I'm trying to like push us a little bit, that's not the only place liturgy happens in our lives. Right? Let's let's go with this a little. Let's go with this a little. But any questions or any 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 thoughts? Yeah. I didn't think about this before, but the tree of life hmm. were Adam and Eve, I assume, partaking of it. So what we, we don't know definitively. What we know is that they had access to eat of the tree of life, right? Mm -hmm. We also know that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. Just so that we're all clear. Is God punishing them? Is that a punishment? What is it? It's a consequence. You eat of this, you will surely... I don't want to, I don't want to take you off your thought, but so... What we know is that after they ate of the tree, because they entered into death, lest they eat of the tree of life and remain in their death forever, God suspended the ability to eat from the tree of life. Whether they were consuming from it prior to, one can only like surmise. I just like the fact that you said the Eucharist existed before. Yeah. And the tree of life is Christ. It's always. And so I think that's... The modern day tree of life is the Eucharist because the Eucharist is the medicine for immortality. So those who eat from the tree of life will live forever. So the Eucharist is the pledge of our immortality. He who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will live forever. And that's why we believe that the restoration of the tree of life is in the cross and in the resurrection. Right? Because the way to the tree of life was blocked but now it is restored back to us. Like if you, I, I, This was my talk Good Friday last year. So this was the, the way to the tree of life again. So it's, uh, it's definitely accessible to every single one of us. I don't want to derail us. So. No, no, no. But, it's, but I, there was, a, like, again, I'm just thinking about my approach to liturgy as I've developed in my life. I always used to be like, why do they make us do this? Right? But it's very different in my mind versus thinking or believing that this is something that we drew up versus believing that this is what God always intended. Right? The, 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 the difference is astronomical in my mind. For me, it, it was life-altering. This is what God always intended. This wasn't like a, yes, every culture approached God in their way, in their in their with their mannerisms, with their words, right? But within the same truth of who God is and with the same understanding of who we are. And that's what the, that's, so when we, there's the Eucharist, which is a liturgy, it is the liturgy of liturgies, right? 
But liturgy for us is, is, is beyond just the Eucharist. Right? We, we even have, actually, the, the way this has been, like, if we come back just to, I have this slide here, and I don't know if you can, but something I tried to draw up just to kind of, it's funny that we talked about prayer and repentance first, and then liturgy, because that's the preparation of self in order to enter into Eucharist. And then next week is service. And actually, the church calls that the liturgy after the liturgy. Because if liturgy is God's work originally and we're participating in it, we're created to work with Him. We're created to be His hands and feet. We're created to to be caretakers. We're created to be prophets. And in Christ, we saw the perfection of all three of those roles, the completion of all three of those roles. All of a sudden, man, who was no longer immortal, Right? Man moves from immortal to mortal. That's the cause of the fall. Right? Man is no longer moves from incorruption to corruption, right? Man loses the indwelling. No, man no longer has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That union with God is now taken from him. Okay? Man is no longer in God's presence. Man, in fact, stops being a caretaker of the world and starts being a consumer of the world, a destroyer of the world, if you think about it. So the fall reversed everything we were created to be. And the whole Old Testament was all about trying to bring us back slowly, right? Imperfectly, because the only person who was going to complete all of that was the person of Christ. Because I love this, I love this quote from St. Athanasius. Actually, from St. Cyril. And again, this is what I think of when I, when I think of liturgy. And again, when I think about like God's plan, that liturgy is our plan. It was always God's plan. Anybody? Uh, actually, I don't know. I'll read it. So. Was it right that one who was created for life and immortality should be made mortal and condemned to deal without power of escape? Must the envy of the devil be more unassailable or enduring than the will of God? Does anybody understand that quote? No. Yeah. I really do feel like I've lost. I feel like it might be. I'm sorry, guys. I really am sorry. Must the envy... What do you think of that? Why did the, why did the devil destroy us? Why did the devil seek to destroy? Why go to Eve and... Why? His desire was to... His, his envy was for us to be along with him, right? Not with God. To be destroyed. To enter into death. St. Cyril's asking here... Is the envy of the devil greater than God's will for us? If God created us to work with him, is God going to leave man to the envy of the devil? No, there's no way. Right? He even says so. He says, not so. Right? It's right there. He answers it. No way. No way. That's why, like, again, like, I, some, like, I, we, Man, I love, like, I love that I can look back. I, I'm really looking back at myself. I used to read that, oh, man, God had to kick them out, and they probably had a convention, the, the Trinity, and we're like, what do we do now, right? Like, oh, well, what if, no, that's, what if one of us, uh, I'll go. Are you sure, Jesus? It's not like, there was never, it was always, like, the devil's going to come, we're going, to create, we're going to create someone that we're going to pour ourselves into called man. And the devil's going to try to destroy him. But he's not going to win. So we're going to give him Eucharist. We're going to give him liturgy. We're going to give him life. We're going to give him victory. Always the plan. Never a backup. When I come to the altar, that is where I am meant to be. That is where God wants me. That's where he designed me. And that's where he desired, because there we can correct what was destroyed. Right? 
There's no other way. There was no other way because he says so, right? He says, right? And look, look at our, look at our, uh, these are three, our, our liturgies that we use in the church, right? Salvation could only come through the person of Christ, right? So in, in the Basil liturgy, which we pray, when we disobeyed your commandment by the sea, we fell from eternal life, we're exiled. In the last days, you manifested yourself to us, we're sitting in darkness. In the glory of one plant, you forbade me to eat that of which you said to me of it only. But I, according to my will, I did eat. You, the infinite being God, emptied yourself, took the form of a servant. You've come to slaughter as a lamb even to death. Christ had to come, and he had to give us his body and blood because that was always going to be the plan for life. Now, that doesn't mean God wanted us to sin. But God is not surprised. God is not like. So when I come to liturgy, when I come to any liturgy, any this is now what I, what the thing is is like. Again, we're speaking mainly about the Eucharist. This here, this gathering is liturgy. There is life present here. His life is present amongst us. If I'm willing to receive it, well, how is that possible? What do you guys think? How is life present here? Imaginary kid of Hawa. Try to grab some. Where is it? Hmm? His words? Where else? Within each of us. Are you not, dare I say, are you not Theotokos? Are you not a bearer of God? Did you not come on Sunday and partake of the body and blood in all imperfection that we have? And we're going to talk about that, right? Like, can the mystery still happen in... Did you not partake of the body and blood? Do you not... Were you not baptized in the waters and died with him? and then sealed with his spirit. Are you not Theotokos? It feels blasphemous. I honestly, I'm saying, and I'm like waiting for something to get thrown at my head. Huh? Yeah. Christophoros. I'm, but I'm like, I'm pushing, my, I'm pushing it a little bit. God, What's the reality, though? Right? It is a term, and it was necessary that it be, it, for, the, for, the, for the virgin, it has a very specific. But we either are eating the body and blood of God, of the second person of the Trinity, God himself, or we're not. We either bear him in truth, or we don't. And it's, they used to say, like, I, there used to be in the, in, the, in the tradition, and I think it's St. John Chrysostom, and I'm going to butcher the, 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 but he used to say the one who would come out of communion, the one who would come out of Eucharist, was like a lion breathing fire. A lion breathing fire. That's the power of God. Very real. When I'm coming to liturgy, when I'm coming to any liturgy, Again, I'm not just talking, the Eucharist being central amongst them. Do I believe that I am encountering God? And not only encountering Him, but bringing Him. To be encountered with by others. It's a, it's, I am not saying I am God. I'm not saying, but I'm not saying I'm holy. I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is what we believe. The Lord said, this is my, eat, my, this, my body is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So where does he live? He either lives in us or he doesn't. Not my words. His words. And his words are life and truth, Myrna. 
Don't question. No such thing. I have two-year-olds, so there's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> and five-year-olds, whose questions are worse than the two-year-olds. Go ahead, sorry. Um, I, I can't help but wonder then, like, what is the significance of, like, our church having, like, multiple liturgies throughout the week, for example? Yeah. Like, if, it, if this is something that, you know, I am the bearer of God at any given moment, yeah. what, what is the significance of me going back and doing it? I, I love that question. What do you guys think? I'm going to shut up for a while. Drink some water. What do you think? Why? Why continue to go back to the table? Right. Like this life is, like last I checked, it's been two hours since I last sinned. I'm probably on my way. I'm due for one soon, right? Like, okay. Overdue, yeah. Okay. But there is a promise. There is a promise at that table, right? There is a truth that happens now because of the Lord's incarnation, because he who took our flesh pours himself into this bread and this wine and truth. He promises us healing. He promises us restoration. And as long as we're here, I, I, I need healing. But I will say this, and, and, and I will count. It has been known and I think St. Mary of Egypt is a wonderful example. Suffered 17 years in the desert, took one communion once, left the earth, right? Was so what I'm saying is like, it has the power to be once in faith and necessary throughout our lives, right? But like, I think we would do ourselves a disservice to be like, oh, I took it once, I'm good, right? It's kind of, that was almost... Almost salvation in a moment. I took communion once, right? Almost, but I'm not going to go that far. But you get what I'm saying? But the recognition is in my need for him. It's not in the lack of the mystery. It's not in the lack of God. It's in my recognition because I think somebody said it. What ultimately happens is the worst exchange ever. My life for his. He really gets the short end of the stick on that one. But he is glad and happy to take it every single time. That is a deal he will make. That is a deal he's already made. That's a deal that was the plan from the beginning. Come to me, you who are tired and heavy laden, and say, right? I will give you rest. So like, I'm not the smartest man in the world. But I do think that that is a deal that I want to take advantage of. Like, there is brokenness in me and there is restoration in him. There is sickness and there is healing in him. I would be doing myself the greatest disservice to keep myself away from liturgy from the Eucharist. And this is going to be a personal plea from brother to brothers and sisters. Do not ever keep yourself away from the table of the Lord. That is not from God. Because his design was for you to go to the table, to be at the table with him. And if you've ever felt, I'm not worthy, I'm a sinner, I, can't, I don't belong there. What would God think of me? Then I will say, you are the perfect person to walk into church that day. Then I especially want to see you. Because the beauty of it, the beauty of this work of liturgy is there is very little to almost no dependency on us. Like in the sense of all we do is offer. But actually, there's, there's some silent prayers that I want us to look at. One of them is, is absolutely my favorite. I'll, I'll, I'll go to some of these, but just as we're talking about this topic. This is the priest now praying silently as he's about to administer. I love small fonts for some reason. I don't know why. I, I just would like to make people suffer. Okay. Remember, O oh Lord, this is the priest. 
right? This is, this is the priest. Remember, remember, O Lord, my own weakness and forgive my many sins. And where transgression has abounded, let your grace be multiplied in abundance. Because of my own sins and the abomination of my heart, deprive not your people of the grace of your Holy Spirit. I love Abuna Elijah to death. I've known him coming on 30 years, something like that. He's not perfect, believe it or not. Sorry, Abuna. Yeah, 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 right? But there's a beauty in that. That even the administer, administrator, administer of the administerer of the, of the sacrament comes in imperfection to be perfected. We sometimes have, have, have messed up what happens in liturgy. We think perfection is needed. No. Imperfection is required because perfection is already is on the receiving end. You are receiving perfection. If you're already perfect, you have no need for perfection. Come in your imperfections to liturgy. This gathering, if it's truly liturgy, has to be the place where imperfect people come to be together to encounter God. Because that's liturgy. Right? This is not for, I mean, yeah, I, I want you to have wonderful weeks and I want you to, but it's okay if you come broken down. I just had a miserable week. Because if this is liturgy, you will find healing. When we gather in our homes, that's liturgy. Any time. Again, this is the meaning genuinely of what when two or three are gathered, I promise to be in their midst. Like just to sit and have Shay. You know what? Shay can be liturgy. Shay offered tea, 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 right? Chai, whatever. Tea offered in the name of Christ right, is liturgy. He who offers a cup of cold water in the name of an apostle, right, that's liturgy. All of a sudden, the the definition of liturgy is now broadened well beyond just the two hours that I can't bear to stand there because Matthew just is way too loud that day, okay? I get it. I'm sorry. I've been there. I know. I've heard it all, okay? Don't come for Matthew and don't come for Abuna. Come because you have a need. Come because God wants you there. That's it. Liturgy is intimacy. And I know that word sometimes makes people uncomfortable. The divine liturgy specifically is the most intimate of moments with your beloved. And like, you know, those who are in, 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 like, intimacy between a husband and wife is central to their connection, should be fostered, should be grown, right? That's where you, you, like, so God is saying, all of me is for you. Ah. Uh, just really tired this week. Okay. In his perfection, he will never say no to you when you're ready to come. But please don't keep yourself from being with him. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so do you want to repeat the question? Um, doesn't St. Paul say something in, I think, First or Second Corinthians about taking it in an unworthy manner? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. There needs to be... So, okay, like, and I'll, I'm going to take that question with... The holy is for the holies, right? We say that in the liturgy. You know what should happen when that's said? Everybody should run. <laughs> Just run. <laughs> not holy, not here, not me. 
right? If the holy is for the holies, eh, some deacons should get to work and start pushing people out of the church. Sorry, nobody, nobody's ready for this today. But, but, huh? Go ahead, please. The holy is for the holies. Oh my God, I'm blanking everyone. It's not my job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One is the ho- yeah exactly right. We, we, we say the holies are for the holies. Yeah. Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification is by the Holy Spirit. Right. That's why you see me when I turn, I scream it off the top of my lungs yeah. because I want every single person and their mother and their grandmother and the heavens and the earth to hear it yeah. because the holies are for the holy. Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ who by his Holy Spirit sanctifies us and makes us worthy to approach the holy of the holies. None of us are worthy to approach it. But you know the one precursor where you should leave your gift at the altar? You know what the one thing is that is like you shouldn't partake of the Eucharist? Is if you have beef with someone. Mm. You should go reconcile with some, that person before you come approach the altar. That's the, that's, the, that's the precursor of precursors because you can't have oneness with God if you don't have oneness with, the, with your brother. How can you come and receive him without reconciling this way in order to have reconciliation this way? It is why we actually don't start the liturgy till after the prayer of reconciliation. Right? We have to, so you can't like... And also, like, we've talked about, like, so I'll go back to the cycle f- picture real quick. There needs to be, and there should be in our lives. Sorry, did you have? Uh, yeah, I think I can. Sorry, again, it's the small fonts thing. Okay. Thanks, I uh, drew it myself. No. <laughs> okay, so, like, you're right. We can't just, we shouldn't. Just show up. I'm saying God will accept you as you show up. But what St. Paul is saying, like, prepare yourself. You're coming to meet the Holy One. It's what we talked about with prayer and repentance the last two weeks. If that's not the life, because, again, this slide is actually called the life of liturgy. Liturgy is not a momentous thing, a moment. Liturgy is a life. And it's a constant. And there's going to be ups and downs, and there's going to be breaking of this. But this is the cycle of liturgy. I have to prepare myself. Right? I am not a good husband if I'm not working on myself. Right? I'm not a good spouse to my wife. If I'm not preparing myself to, to be mentally, physically, right, sharp, spiritually, emotionally sharp for her, right? Then, then it's the same with God. I have to have a level. And the preparation really is a, is a level setting of the relationship. And ultimately, it comes down to my need for him. Right? My need for him. That becomes what self-preparation is. And I experience him through prayer, and I come through repentance, and through repentance, I recognize, oh, I need him, I need him more than I thought. Right? And the church has liturgies to help us with that preparation. And I'll say this, like, this is, like, we're all busy. I get that. But Saturday night is not like singles night. Like it is the night of preparation, right? It's why we have Vespers. It's why we have midnight praises. It's why we ultimately have matins the next morning. Because liturgy doesn't start in, it starts like in, so we, if, we, if we're doing this life, if we're offering incense and then offering our praise and, our, and ourselves, then all of a sudden, I've just spent an evening with the person that I'm about to go and be intimate with. How much deeper is the intimacy going to be? Versus just showing up to be intimate, right? There's, like, it becomes transact. If you're not preparing yourself, you enter into a transactional relationship with God. But if you are throwing yourself in that life of preparation, then the intimacy is built on connection. Does that make sense? And there are two liturgies. There's two communions that happen when we gather. There's the liturgy of the Word, which is a communion. right? We are communing around the Word of God and present. We are receiving Him, and He's present. He's just manifesting Himself in a, in a spoken way. And then we have communion again, 
in a physical way, right? This is the life of liturgy, right? And then, oh, sorry, yeah, Mark, yeah, please, John. Sorry. So I just, I just wanted to add one little thing to the question, right? Um, Christ gave an example one time of two people that went in to pray, right? And one left justified and one left not justified. And so when St. Paul says, if you take communion or worthily, you take unto yourself judgment, Yes, God will accept you whatever way you come as long as you're coming with a repentant heart. Like the two people that God talked about, one came in and said, Lord, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Paraphrasing, of course. The other one said, oh, I'm great. I should be here. And the guy who thought he was great left and didn't receive anything. The guy who came and knew his state and poured that state in front of the Lord was the one that left with everything he was supposed to leave with. So, you know, you can come and take communion every day if you want. And the one can correct me, but if you're not repenting, if communion to you is an act, the power of communion is not explicit by itself. The power of communion is the same as every other sacrament. It is only empowered by you taking it. Like, I can take communion and it means nothing in my life. You can take communion and you breathe fire coming out of there. It's the same communion. But whether I took it and it did anything was dependent on how I approached that communion. So being prepared is coming in understanding of, of my true state and bringing that and putting it in front of the Lord. What St. Paul was talking about were people coming in to the church, taking communion. It's nothing. Yeah, we come on Sunday, we take communion. That's just what we do. And he's like, yeah, that's, it's really not working for you. They actually used to eat and feast even before they got, like it was a whole kind of a, so yeah, I mean, but so thank you, John. There was another question. guy sleeping with his dad's wife like it's just a hot mess so just important when you read scripture understand context and but definitely as john was saying there's that piece of uh which it's not magic right like so what you put in is what you will get if the if if the eucharist is bread and wine to you it will be bread and wine to you if the eucharist is medicine for a broken person it will be medicine for a broken person so it's really what you put what your what you what your expectation is of what you are receiving and there are many people who take communion and then go home and beat their wives right so it's like sorry to trigger anyone but that's the reality right like this is like communion is not changing the person unless the person wants to be changed so that's why we have churches filled with people that are coming and partaking in the eucharist and i'm not really sure they understand what they're taking and that's why hopefully, by the grace of God, as we're sitting here and attending, we're saying, okay, God, you're trying to take some, you're trying to take my brokenness and give me your life. Amen. Let me have some of that. Like, I need that in my life. Like, I need that. I need whatever you have offered to me because I'm a broken, messy person. And because of my messiness, bring it. Just keep on giving me as much of that as I possibly can. And I'm going to come time and time again telling you how broken I am in a repentant soul. Because repentance is not like, oh, I'm the worst, Lord, I stink, I'm terrible. Repentance, I am desperately broken, and I want to be on the right track. And you are the one that puts me on the right track. You are the person that heals me. You are the physician of my soul. So I just want to make sure we're grasping what Matthew's trying to tell us. Like, this is not like a, oh, come to the altar. This is cool stuff that you are receiving. Oh, let's sing some hymns. Like, it's nice. Like, no, this Wait, is Wait, that like, is what I'm saying. No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> This is like, this is the real deal. Jesus is offering himself to every single one of us time and time again. And what you, if you want the healing, he is more than happy to give it. Y'all with me? Diana, do you want to say something? I'm, no, I'm no. Just, I get passionate about this. I know. So this is the, is the topic. Yeah. Please. 
Um, I think I was going to ask that aren't there like rules uh, before you, you can't take communion if you missed out the liturgy part and there's another one about like you have to go for confession first and there's like that's a separate rule from the sin that you're talking about. does it turn into a curse if you don't do that I heard that before no, that's no. yeah yeah that's that's not okay. Officially not Christian. And if you find out two years, you think it's just one time, and you're like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Let me, and let me tell, like, just very simply, right? There isn't an, there isn't a power greater than God's, right? So like this idea that it can turn, like there are like, look, God bless our parents and their parents and everyone <laughs> else. We love them. They try to scare us straight, and I get it, right? That's kind of like the, they're trying to keep us out of prison kind of a thing. Don't take communion. I get that, okay? That's an approach. That's an approach. I'm going to take a different approach with you guys. The approach I want to take with you is simply this. You have one who loves you greater than anyone can love. And who doesn't want to be loved? Who, ha- who amongst us hasn't sought out love? And I'll be honest with you, like, my early years, my teenage years, even my early, like my early 20s, were all about looking for love in the wrong places. And I was changing myself and trying to be things in order to be loved. But little did I actually realize that the one who loved me was always waiting to exchange his life for mine. And that's what intimacy, re- like any intimacy, right? I'm not just talking physical intimacy, right? There is, like I can go into intimacy just to be satisfied and leave. And ultimately, that, you can take communion that way. Like, I can just go into intimacy just to get whatever it is that I, whatever endorphin I need to be fed, my ego fed, right? Like, and I'm talking about even friendships, right? You can have, I'm not talking just physical. Or I can be vulnerable, and I can allow the person in front of me to be vulnerable, and we can genuinely come into real relationship. We, we are seeing each other as we are and accepting for each other as we are and building the relationship on that. Those are two very different models of intimacy. And the model of liturgy is that second one. The more vulnerable you are with God about your necessity for Him, the more you open up space in your life to make Him work in you and live in you. Matt, I have to ask the question, but why does it got to be so long? You know, it's all these inaudible prayers. that the I blame the priest, actually. I don't blame the... the, No, listen... Yeah, the length, look, the length is a thing, okay? I, I, look, and it's, but I blame the deacons too. I blame myself. And actually, look, I, I'm always for a longer liturgy personally. But let me ask you this, though. If I, no, I agree, I agree. But here's the thing. If I'm in the presence of someone I love, Genuinely, I'm not thinking about the time, right? I'm not saying we can't shorten sometimes. I'm not saying we can't lengthen sometimes. But if I'm genuinely just in the presence of the one I love, the time doesn't matter. Oh, that was an amazing night. We spent eight hours laughing about nothing. But I can't be two hours in the presence of the one who loves me and is giving his life for me. And I will say this. The designers of liturgy, right, the designers of the, the worship, always had purpose in what they've done. Everything is meant to heighten the experience because liturgy is experience. So, yeah, if I'm owing out there, like, oh, and you're like, what is, why is he a cow right now? What is going on, right? If I'm just like, I get that. I, I feel your pain sometimes. Most times not. But I feel your pain. The designer of that hymn actually is trying to tell me and tell us that this word that you're on is almighty. And if you stop and think, wait, almighty, 
yeah, maybe I can spend a little time in contemplating the Almighty. And I stop thinking about my clock, my watch. I just start thinking about the experience with the one I love. But if it's not in that relationship, it's always going to be long. Right? But like, ask yourself, you like being around the people you like being? We all do. Have you ever tried to shorten that experience? Yes. A follow-up question. Please. I love questions. So, Because Abuna's mean... here. He can answer anything. No. <laughs> so you can confirm that if I come late to liturgy, I can still take communion and nothing. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I said Abuna. Let me, let me jump in on this one. <laughs> so... I always will say this. There's not really a point in time that, like, you're late. There's, you missed, like, the moment liturgy starts, if you've missed five minutes, you're late. But if there's a context for why you're late, like, if there's a reason for why I'm late, then, of course, don't hinder yourself. But if it's just you rolled out of bed a little bit too late, then maybe you have to value yourself, evaluate whether you're prepared enough in terms of you just, like, like enjoying his presence, that you feel like I should come and I should partake of the Eucharist. By the way, the reason why the church says the cutoff is the gospel, like just as a fun fact, is because if you don't partake of the word in the word, reading, listening to his word, then you shouldn't partake of the word in his flesh. So that's why we say the cutoff is the gospel, because you've heard something from the word of God, but that's the, it's baloney, because you should have been there before there. You miss the absolution where we absolve you of your sins. You miss the partaking of all the readings which are trying to give you a message to point you towards Christ. You miss like so much that happened even before that. So uh, I, that's why the, the cutoff business is really like, it's, fo it's baloney. Like if you're showing up to a job interview late, you, you're late. Like you're late. Just show up on time. You know, if you show up to work late, you're boss is like, dude, you're late, like you're, you're in trouble. Why is it okay if we show, we show up late to meet the king of the universe? And that's, I think, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, why am I showing up late? Do I have a reasonable reason? Like, did I not feel well this morning? Do I have children that just blew out their diapers before I got here and I had to change their diaper? Like, is there a context to my lateness or is it just pure laziness? And if it's pure laziness, suck it up, buttercup. Like, let's get it going. Let's get back on, like, try to get here on time, wake up a little bit l earlier, prepare from the night before. Like, there's a context for it. So when somebody says to me, Abuna, I'm late. Can I take communion? Sure. I'm not going to be the one to deprive you for com communion, but come early next time. Yeah. Like, it's, that's your conscience because the Bible does say if you come and approach the altar in an unworthy manner, you've taken on yourself co condemnation. So have I, have I prepared myself? Have I repented? Have I done the due diligence to see even what my need for the Eucharist is? If I'm coming willy-nilly like, yeah, give me some Jesus because I need it. Like, you're approaching it in an unworthy manner. Say, I need you, Lord, because I'm broken. I need healing. So this, sorry, forgive me. I get, I get worked up about this because it's, it's total baloney. Like, it's totally, this come at the cutoff of the gospel makes no sense to me. And I'm, I'm going to say two things, if that's Thank okay. You. Say as no. much as you want because I... I, I Okay, so first, first is, a, is a beautiful story from the life of Abu Nabshoi Kamil, right? The, as the story goes, as I understand it, and again, a lot of these things get handed down because they were originally in Arabic, but what I understood is that one day he was running, like, first of all, men in Egypt don't run, apparently. Like, that's, that's like a thing. It's like, hey, for a grown man to run. Like, I, I think that that, even culturally, in, even in the... So even the prodigal son, right, like the, the big thing about the father running is like there is a bit of shame in the idea of an old man running. So you have an elderly man with a beard in a black robe running down the street, get to run. To, and then there's like the people, Abuna, Rafi, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? He's like, Habibi mistanini. So he's like, my beloved one's waiting for me. Should I delay myself? Like, am I going to keep him waiting for me? Right? So that's number one. Like, again, like, I'm going to focus on the relationship first. If it's about the relationship, I don't want to delay being in the presence of the one I love. That's number one. That's the story of Mishkala. The other thing I'll say on the other side, right, what is the first thing we do in liturgy, in any liturgy? What is literally the first thing that we do? Okay, after that, start, yes. And then uh, the, first one we, the first thing in liturgy, huh? The offering and thanksgiving. 
So I'm going to ask you a question. If you think about your whole week and everything that you went through, shouldn't we at least start by saying thank you? Shouldn't we at least show up on time to say thank you? Right? Like, again, I'll use the relationship with my wife. She cares for my kids. She takes care of them. She goes through. If I never say thank you and I just show up to eat dinner every night and I never stop and thank her and I never acknowledge her, I'm a terrible husband. Right? You would pull her aside secretly and be like, Mehdi, what, what are you doing? Like, whip this guy in shape. Like, this guy is so ungrateful. You need to teach him a lesson. Right? Like, something like, hopefully you guys don't do that. I try to say thank you to my wife, right? With God, how much more is he worthy of thanks? So the idea really shouldn't be how late can I get there. The idea is, should I not come and one, if for no other reason, I'm still breathing and I'm still here and despite everything that's going on, I should offer thanksgiving. I should at least be, I should offer myself, right, because that's what's happening. We're offering from what we have and we're offering ourselves and saying, Thank you. We're here because you've covered us, you've helped us, you've supported us, right? And we t- if we did a study on those seven things, right, they're massive. Is it not worth at least saying thank you? So we're trying to like nip and tuck our relationship with him and figure out the way it's most convenient. But he's waiting for us. I think I just, I like... I, 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 I try to instill that in my kids. I, I, like when we wake up in the morning, like I'm literally, Jesus is waiting for us. That's worth getting up for. You know what? Today, Jesus was waiting for you. Again, he's here. And anytime we gather, and any time, next week when you talk about service, oh my God, that's liturgy after, that's bringing Jesus. That's making others not wait on Jesus because Jesus is present, right? That's what the life of liturgy is. Liturgy is life with God. It's relationship. And if you don't put the relationship at the beginning, all the rest of it just becomes rules and practices and all the rest of it. All right, any final questions? I feel like I, yeah. Uh, No, please. Um, it's a little off topic, but it, a question around what actually happens during communion. Mm. Um, like, I know the Catholic Church is more focused on transubstantiation, right. and the Western Church is more on the idea it's, it's more symbolic. But it's what the Orthodox Church believes is, is kind of vague to me, and mm. I'm, I'm trying to get a better idea. Okay, absolutely. I will say this. And this is, I think, the beauty and the most comforting thing that I can say about orthodoxy. Okay? We are very comfortable and okay with mystery. What do I mean? Everything doesn't have to be explained or understood to be real. Okay? Because part of that is, if it could all be understood and explained, then it's not heavenly or godly, it is earthly and man-made. Now, what do we believe happens? Because there is an answer that we have, okay? We believe that at the invocation of the Holy Spirit, and Abuna Elijah and Abuna Mark, more specific, they tend to say it, they say it out loud. It's it's actually a silent prayer. What we believe is at at that moment when Abuna prays that the Holy Spirit descend upon us and upon these gifts, that at that moment, that bread and that wine become the body and the blood of Christ. Now, this does not mean that Abuna is breaking meat, flesh. He is breaking into bread. You are physically consuming a bread. But the Lord says that this bread is his flesh, is, is his body. And that this wine that you are tasting, it's Manischewitz, right? It's Manischewitz or whatever the brand of the day, right? It's still wine. But it is, in truth, the the blood of Christ. How is mystery? Right? So, there are some who try to put under a microscope and whatever, and sometimes they see life cells. Look, 
That's up to God if God wants to reveal His mystery to them. I come in faith, and I come in... And what proves... What proves that this is in fact his body and in fact his blood? There is one thing that happened in history that proves that this is in fact his body and this is in fact his blood. Any ideas? I'll tell you. Huh? No, no, not, not America. It's more, more even, even bigger than that. Close, earlier. You're you're so close. Yeah. No, no, I don't hate you. You're not wrong. But the resurrection. I love you. I love you so. Give me a hug, man. No, come here, come here. You're okay. No, no, I love you, man. Never. Yes, the resurrection, but earlier. I'm not. No is the wrong answer. Yes, the resurrection. You are spot on. The incarnation. If God can become man and take the human flesh indeed and then stand there and say, he who eats my body and drinks my blood is bread and wine, is my body and blood, then his words, if they're truth and his incarnation is truth, then it is in truth. His, the incarnation proves the communion. Do you get what I'm saying? The Eucharist. If we don't have the incarnation and the resurrection, Right? Right? The new, the new incarnation. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's... Then, yeah, maybe you could, you, could, you could cast doubt. You can cast doubt on this idea that God. But if God himself is saying that this is my flesh and this is my body. My, excuse me, this is my body and this is my blood. And because we've experienced him through the incarnation, this is an incarnation. This is an incarnation that's happening. It's the incarnation that's happening. And so it proves that for us. And that for us is enough to believe on without having to explain it sort of scientifically. Does that answer the question? But it's a great question. Yes. Um, okay, so I have a question in regards to... So I had someone approach me, and we were talking about the communion and how it um, truly is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, I know we don't solely go based off of the Old Testament, but they were referring to the Old Testament in terms of how it was wrong for you to consume like the blood of human or something like that and then here we are doing th yeah so someone said something like that how would you have responded well because we're not consuming no we're not consuming a human in that regard right that's literally again like we're not cannibals we're not eating we are again the lord like when the lord broke bread he didn't all of a sudden like He's not breaking a baby in front. Like, it's, it's not a human that he's, like, tearing. Like, he's not eat my flesh. But he's saying, I live in this bread, and I live in this wine, right? It's different than, like, like we're cutting him up. You know, understand what I'm saying? He's like, I exist in this bread. I live in this bread in the same way I live in human flesh, right? I am God, and I'm divine, and I live in this bread. And I live in, yes, John. Like, we live in a two-part world, okay? There's the physical, and then there's the spiritual, okay? When Christ said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, people walked away, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, this is a hard saying. Who mm -hmm. can do this? You know what Jesus didn't do? Change his words. He didn't say, hey, hey, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. Come back. Let me explain more. He didn't do that. Just for context, because I think it's it's really necessary. So he goes on to say, I want to, John 6 is, the, anyone time somebody who denies the, the Eucharist, go to John 6. It's like the best passage. So he goes on to basically say, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread... He will live forever, and that the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then he goes on to talk about his blood. And then verse 60, it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? 
Fast forward, go to John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back. This is the saddest verse in the Bible. I agree. John 6, 6, 6. You never forget that, man. Yeah. This is the saddest verse in the Bible. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, you want to go away also? But look at what Simon Peter says. This is the best part. He says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. John, go ahead. Just needed that scripture. So now take that and put on top of it the fact that we live in, like I said, a two-part world. There's the spiritual and then there's the physical, right? And when Abuna invokes the Holy Spirit and it turns, it turns the body and blood or the bread and wine into body and blood, there's a spiritual aspect that we don't see, right? So is it his body and his blood? Absolutely. Am I eating at that moment? Am I in the physical world eating flesh and blood? No. But in the spiritual world, what am I having? His flesh and blood. Do we understand? The Catholics look at it, the word trans, transubstantiation <laughs> to them means there's the physical changing of the bread component to becoming flesh. But they're trying to link the spiritual and the world, like the physical, in the physical world. Like, they're two worlds, and they're parallel, and everything happens at the same time, but there's a veil on my eye because I don't get to see the spiritual world. Some people do, right? Some people, Lord, the Lord lifts the veil, and they see demons, and they see angels, and they see wars, and I don't want to be that guy, right? I saw that yesterday. I didn't want to <laughs> Well, you're that guy. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to say anything. Yeah, just, no. So that's the difference between the Catholics, the Protestants, and the Orthodox. The Protestants don't think anything happens. Do this in remembrance of me, they think that means just it's a memory. When you do it, remember me because I was cool. That's what they believe. Completely crazy. The Catholics think it is actually changing. The physical essence of the bread is changing to physical body in this world, in the physical world. The Orthodox understand that there's a mystery, and that mystery is in the fact that there's a spiritual world, and then there's a physical world, and in the spiritual world, this is changing to body and blood, and that's why Jesus didn't change his words. Thank you, guys. Any what, other questions? Any other questions? All questions are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you feel like, um, like, for example, when you said that drinking tea together is liturgy. Don't you feel like that kind of cheapens the word? So, it, I, I, again, if, if I define the word, if I define liturgy as, if we say it's the work of the people, it's, or I, I'm, I'm trying to spread the, the definition to the work of the people with God. My point is, if I'm going on a visitation, let's say, and somebody, and I have tea with that person, or George, you and I go out and we bring the presence of Christ into our gathering and we over a cup of tea and we read the word of God or I just ask about how you're doing or I support you in a time of need. Is that not God's work? Right? So I think we think of liturgy as only the divine liturgy. I'm not, that, that is the epitome of liturgy. But if we broaden our understanding to any time I do God's work amongst his people, that's liturgy. I actually think it Beautify, I think it elevates the word and beautifies it. That really anything that I offer, anything that I offer in the name of God to someone else can be blessed, right? So St. John Chrysostom, he says that like the offerings that we offer to the, to the poor can sometimes be, Euchar like they are like the Eucharistic liturgy, right? When we take care of the poor, this is a liturgy unto itself, right? We're going to talk about service. So I actually think the counter, I think... If I can even expand liturgy to a cup of tea with a brother, 
and God's presence is there and we're elevating each other in the presence of Christ as liturgy, I think it makes the word that much more vast and, and, and open for us to, to experience him. You don't have to, do you, I mean, like, okay. Yes. Okay, so I'm a bit conflicted about something. So you said earlier how, like, when we come to liturgy, like, you know, we come with, like, our brokenness, like, to be healed. And, like, I know when Elijah always says, like, church is a hospital. Yes. But then we were talking about coming on time and suck it up buttercup and, like, all that stuff. So yeah. it's like... <laughs> That does, I actually think so, sucking a buttercup is going to be worse than someone <laughs> next. So it's like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, because he was saying, like, he was also saying, like, you know, like, better prepare yourself or, like, you know, like, all that stuff. And it's like, okay, but if I'm coming out of my brokenness, yeah. like, it's. Yeah. And I was going to say, pro broken, I was literally going to say. Please further. Uh, like like the acknowledgement of your brokenness is what leads you to come on time. Yeah. Like, I'm really broken, so I can't miss a minute of this. Like, I really need every second with you, Lord, because every second with you is healing. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of that. Y'all remember when the COVID vaccines came out? Y'all remember when everybody was so freaked out about getting COVID that they were literally trying to do everything in their power. They were stampeding people to get to those COVID vaccines. Why? Because I understand how vulnerable I am from this virus, and I'm going to do everything in my power to get the antidote that will protect me and give me healing. Am I going to show up late to the appointment that I made at CVS or to, to the line? I'm going to get there as fast as I possibly can because my life is on the line. And we don't have that urgency in any shape way, or form when it comes to liturgy. And I think the preparation is the understanding of the urgency. The understanding of I desperately need every second with you, Lord, because one second away from you is a second missed with my beloved physician, yeah. with the one who sees me, the one who takes me as I am, but changes me as I walk out that door, who takes my brokenness and exchanges my, his life with my brokenness. So, yes, come prepared. Come prepared to meet this beautiful wedding banquet that he has prepared for you. But I'm not going to just show up willy-nilly. I'm going to come up, come with a sense of urgency that I really need it. And I'm going to come with a desire to come as I am, but don't leave as you came. And I think a lot of us come as I, we are, and like, Lord, you accept me. I came as I am, but I want to leave differently. And I think that's the thing that we really love in our modern culture is come as you are. Take me as I am. Yes, Jesus takes you as, I, as you are. But in hope that in encountering him as the physician, you don't leave as you came. And many come and leave exactly as they are, and including Mel me many times. I'm not saying that as like a, including me many times. Melanie, I want to ask a question too. Sorry, I'll, I see your hand will come to you. Why is it come as you are often means come in the worst of you? Like why does it mean like put in the least effort, right? Like take me, accept, like come as you are doesn't mean that like mail it in, right? Like, Abuna, like Abuna was saying, like, just because I'm broken doesn't mean I'm not prepared. I can't, I, the brokenness doesn't mean I'm prepared, right? Sick doesn't mean diligent and find, like, also becoming non-diligent and finding healing, right? So what I'm saying is, like, if I recognize I'm sick, then I actually become, to the, the COVID, like, I become more interested. So we often say, oh, if God's going to accept me as I am, then I'm just going to show him the worst of me. That's not actually what we're trying to say. God knows our state. Do I know my state? And if I really know my state, then I'm not going to delay in, in presenting myself to him because he has, he is what will, what will bring me life, what will bring me healing, what will correct the state that I'm in, right? He is what I'm in need of. So I shouldn't delay from taking that, right? But I sometimes think when we say come as you are, we all of a, we all of a sudden put this negative connotation on it as like show up as your worst. Don't put in effort. That's not what we're saying. Right? That doesn't mean you can't come as, coming as your best doesn't mean don't come broken. Right? Come ready to receive him. Present yourself to him willingly. Like, I, 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 I want to change the come as you are thing doesn't mean just like mail it in with him. Right? Do you, does, does that make sense? Sorry, George, there was someone else and then. So, 
No, if it doesn't, yeah. Counterpoint is. Microphone, please. It, it was, oh. I think the way that, like, I'm thinking about it is, like, I know, like, me personally, and, like, I'm going to be vulnerable with you guys. Like, me personally, like, I will have, like, depressed episodes where it's, like, I really need to go to church. But because of, like, the depression, I'm, like, fogged. So it's, like, okay, like, yeah, like, I'm probably going to show up late because I have zero motivation That's to get up. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I mean, I get, but it's, like, I'm confused where it's, like, okay, like, is it good enough that, like, I even showed up? Or is it because, like, I was late and I was slacking? Like, I'm not, like, it's not. God, like, there's no, again, nobody's like holding. Like, that makes sense. It, showing up is the battle. Showing up is, like, yes, you showed up in the, in the presence of a very real and very destabilizing context, right? Like, you're struggling to show up. And I'll be honest with you, right? The enemy can try to use that to keep you from going. You recognized that this was a battle and you overcame the battle by showing up. It's not about what time you show. It's about you showed up. You came in honesty. You came through your struggle. You presented that struggle to him. That is acceptable to the Lord, right? What, what, we're, what, we're, saying, what we're saying is if I'm capable and I'm well and all is like, you know, and it's a Sunday morning and I need an extra half hour and it's like, compassionate community of of clergy that we've never told somebody who's approached the altar do not come like very i can't I, I have never done it like i personally have never done it like i don't have it in me to tell somebody you can't receive jesus all we're saying is if you're coming sick you're sick like you're you're not feeling well so come like if you got here come but I'm talking about the people that very well know what they're doing when they're showing up very late because they just snoozed or they just didn't feel like coming on time or they intentionally tried to make it at the prayer of reconciliation. I'm talking about those people. So there's a context to every single person's situation. If you're not well, if you're coming in and you're struggling, if you had a rough morning, if you're going through an episode of sadness, if you're struggling, come, 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 come. Like keep, like please. Don't make that a, a, like a hindrance, but if you are coming and you truly, you know very well that you showed up late intentionally, just, it's on you. I'm not going to tell you no, but it's on you. And Buna, can I just mention one verse? Please. There's a verse in Hebrews 12, um, and, and the reason I love this verse is because its context is so open-ended, Right? Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 4 says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. St. Paul sets a standard to what we're expected to do generally in our spiritual life, right? Which is strive with everything we have. That's the measure. If in the fog you strove with everything you have and you showed up late, then you've fulfilled the commandment, right? Right? But if I woke up and, like Abuna saying, I'm spending extra time because my hair's not doing it right, and I need it to be curly this way and not that way no, because I don't want to show up. No, I the liturgy to see where right? I'm because I'm like... Like, that's not striving till bloodshed, right? So the idea of strive till bloodshed, that means give it everything you have. If you've given it everything you have, and you can't... Maybe you can lie to yourself, you can't lie to him, Right? If you've given it everything you have and you showed up, then that's what Abuna's saying. Take communion. But if you're late because, you know, you didn't prepare your clothes from the night before and you had to, like, spray the... Like, all this stuff, that's not giving it everything you have. Right? That's, that's the commandment. Uh, poor... Yeah, sorry. I can't see... Yeah, please. Go ahead. You've been, ha like, very patient. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I think I was actually... I was trying to acknowledge what Melanie was saying before you acknowledge... And then... We, we answered it, but I will say that, like, I think that there is a spiritual battle that comes specifically before every single liturgy, 
and it's very it's very real. Like it's easy to come to church on time for whatever reason. Think about it on a Thursday meeting, right? When you know you're going to meet up with friends after. But there's something about Sunday morning or whatever liturgy right before it it becomes at least for me personally, right? Like I have like I I can't wake up. I like snooze mind you I wake up at five in the morning every day like why am I all of a sudden like can't get up on a a seven that's sleeping in for me but I recognize and I acknowledge that I'm like this is a spiritual battle like I'm recognizing that the devil is working 10 times as hard to get me to not go to the liturgy because the liturgy is what's going to transform me right like and when I recognize that I'm able to fight against it And the fighting against it is through prayer, right? And through other people acknowledging that with you and encouraging you, right? You know, I went to church the other day. I was in Baltimore, and a friend of mine, like, wasn't there. And I went up to her husband, and I said, hey, where's your wife? She's like, you know, like, she's just, I hate when people ask me that. Like, I just wanted to, like, sleep. I wanted her to sleep in today. It's okay. I didn't wake her up. And I was like, no. So I called her, and I said, hey. Where are you? Because we used to do this. We used to, like, do this for each other. I was like, hey, where are you? Like, she was like, oh, like, I just woke up. I guess, like, you know, my husband left without me. But, like, you know, you know. I was like, no, I'm going to come pick you up. Be ready in 10 minutes. Like, having a friend keep you accountable, right? Like, that's w- true friendship, right? Like, I'm going to go pick you up. I'm not going to let you be lazy today. And I'm going to re- keep you accountable. Because we could be lazy in everything else. We, you want to skip a day of work? Fine. But, like, don't skip out on what's important. The liturgy is going to be the thing that, like, is the hardest for you to get to, especially when you're starting out in your spiritual, like, walk again after being far from God. Like, I say this a lot, and I see it a lot with friends that are, like, struggling to come back to church. They come back for the meetings, anything else. But the liturgy is really what, like, they can't come back to. Yeah. It's just hard, and they're like, oh, it's just boring. No, it's it's a mental, like, gymnastics that happens that morning, and that depression comes even harder, especially, I think, for people, like, when you have the desire. And so, like, acknowledging and recognizing that, because that happens to me, too. Like, I suddenly become super anxious, and I'm like, oh, I haven't slept. I'm, like, depressed. It's my one day off. Like, I don't really want to go on a Sunday. Like, you know, but just... That I just wanted to acknowledge it and and recognize that we all go through that. I'm sure even Abuna goes through that. Like I, I have no choice. I, I know, but like your it's your job. But like I'm sure before, right? Like w- let's a, let's a, let's acknowledge it. Like I think everybody goes through it, and it's like it's hard to get yourself there. So just I, I love how vulnerable everybody is. Then everybody, how real everybody's being. Like just saying it's a struggle. Like the yeah. struggle's real. So, and I think that's the first part of it. Like there's a a Wednesday crew that comes to 5 a.m. liturgy, and there's one guy that calls like 15 people. It annoys the heck out of them, FaceTiming them, driving them crazy to get them to come to liturgy. And go that crew of people that are responding to that and coming. Like there's a power in encouragement, and there's a power also for us as like the people who are like leading liturgy to help make it an enjoyable experience. So if we're praying in a language that you don't understand, if we are praying hymns that you don't really understand they're going on it's on us to make sure it's accessible to every single person who's attending because liturgy should be accessible to every single person that enters into the door it shouldn't be something that's foreign so that's on us to to continue to improve as a community and that's on us to make sure that it's something that's powerful for every single person Um, my question is, like, in this context, what does it mean for people who have never taken uh, communion? Does that mean God is not dwelling within them? So, it's a great question. All of the above? Okay. So, let me, let me start by saying what we believe and what we know, and then I will say. So, and Abuna, please, like, add on it. Um, What we know is that the church is tried and true. The ark that we're on saves and that there's truth in it and all that we live and all that we experience with God in it is true. 
What we don't know, being on this ark, is what happens to those who are not on the ark. Okay? So, like, very simply, is God able to save those outside of the church? It's within His power. No one will put a limitation on it. What we know, what the church is trying to tell us, get on this boat, we know, where, we know that this boat saves. We know that this is salvation. We know that God lives. Now, it has been that the Spirit of God, like in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God could come for a time and would leave for a time, right? God can dwell momentarily on people. I will never put limitations on what God is able to do and where God will dwell and not dwell. But what I can say without a shadow of a doubt, those who are on this ark and preparing themselves and living righteously and seeking God, we know that this is the, we know it because we have a track, like we have the cloud of witnesses, we have the saint, right? So we're not trusting ourselves, we're trusting God and the work that he's done on all those who've been on this same boat that we're on. Does that make sense? I don't want to like, and I don't think we should, I don't think that's our job at any point is to say, you don't have God, you don't have Christ, you don't have Christ. Right? You don't have. I know, I take him at his word. Right? And in his word, he says we have to be baptized. Right? In his word, we have to, he says we have to take his body and blood in order to have life. That's his word. And I'm following his word. So I know definitively this is truth, this works. Is there other ways for him? That's, I don't know, Abuna, if you want to I think that's that. perfect, but I think just for the sake of time, because it's almost 9.30, yeah. uh, we're going to wrap up, and if anyone has any comp comp questions, you could ask them all to Matt or John. Um, <laughs> they, are, they have all the answers, um, but I just think for the sake of time, just to be yeah. mindful. Thank you all, honestly. Thank you, for, thank you Matt, so much. for. Thank you, guys. I want to end.